Today we're going to cover some of my essential bandsaw jigs and fixtures. If you attended last week's bandsaw basics class, you learned a good bit about scroll sawing and resawing at the bandsaw and how to do it safely. This week I'm going to run through a few of my favorite jigs and fixtures that help you use that saw more efficiently, effectively, and still safer yet. So without any further delay, let's get started. The first jig I'm going to show you today is a simple dovetail jig. I know everybody's got a jig for cutting dovetails, but this one actually works on the bandsaw. So what I've got are three pieces of plywood, two pieces of half inch. I'm just making a small version of this right now. I cut the two half inch pieces the same size, doesn't matter what size they are, you can make them any size you like. So this piece is going to end up being the two cross braces that we're going to cut on the angle to get our dovetails up at the angle that we like. So the first thing I need to do is head over to the table saw and put whatever degree angle I want on the ends of this board. This board is actually a little wider than my jig so that way I can cut it down to match. So the first thing I need to do, like I said, come up with whatever angle I'm going to cut. And I think the easiest way to do that is to set my bevel gauge and say, you know, I kind of like that angle today. So Pick whatever angle you like. If you like 5 degrees, you like 7 degrees, like 20 degrees, whatever you want. And we're going to go over and set the table saw. So that you can see everything, I am going to remove the guard from my saw. Pull it, pull it, pull it. Come on, you can do it. There's the angle I set. I want to tilt the blade over to that same angle. If you have a lock, lock it so that it doesn't change. I'm going to readjust my height so that I'm not too tall up there Come with the blade cutting through my, my plywood. Reset my saw to 90 degrees, and the first thing we're going to do is cut one section. The first thing we're going to do is cut one section off of that board. That's going to be the small end of my jig. So I'm going to give it about a maybe an inch and a half, maybe a little more, between the, the heel of my bevel there and the end of my board. So the first thing I want to do is come in a little off the end, make that flush, transfer that mark and now I can go cut that off on the table saw. With that done, I can make this make my square flush on the end, draw that line down, and now I can just mount whoops, got it upside down. I want the wide end at the other end. So now I can clamp that in place and attach it with nails or screws, whichever suits you best. I'm 
I'm going to attach it with a, a few 18 gauge pins. With the assembly out of the vise, I mark the other end, the same as the first. I've now put that the remainder of this initial piece that I cut the angles on into my vise. I line up that pencil line with the outside face of my remaining material. And then using a square, I bring it right, right up and transfer the mark onto the plywood. So there's where I've got to cut my material. Head back over to the table saw. We'll give that a quick cut. Now that I've got that all cut, I want to double check to make sure that everything is in line. And it looks like it lines up perfectly, so I can now attach my second angled piece to my top, and then it's just a question of attaching the bottom. You'll want to set any nails that happen to be protruding and off to the bandsaw we go. So whether you're a pins first person or a tails first first, oh, who am I kidding? You better be a pins first person. It doesn't really matter. You can obviously cut out tails directly on the bandsaw without any guide at all. I've got my marking gauge set to the thickness of the two boards being joined. my baseline just like I was cutting it by hand. Love my uh, Veritas wheel marking gauges. They leave a, leave a nice clean deep score line. And now if I'm cutting my pins first, which is what this jig is set to cut, what I can do is because they're pins the angle is on the end of the board. So that means the, the straight lines are on the face of the board. So all I have to do is draw those straight lines in where I want them and then just follow them on the bandsaw. Find my mid so I have a half pin on either side. Find my middle. Come out a little on either side of that. And this is all waste and this is all waste. So let's cut them. So if you're not really familiar with basic geometry, you've got a conundrum here. However, I understand that Two parallel lines bisected by another line 
means that my alternate interior and exterior angles are the same. So in order to get to cut the other half of my pins, all I have to do is turn the jig around and mount it the other way. Clamp my board on and let's cut the other half. And there you have it, one set of perfectly cut pins. If I was gonna do an entire case side or a whole bunch of drawers, this is an awesome way to very rapidly cut out all of those pins without any trouble. All I gotta do now is go remove that waste however I like to do it. If I wanna coping saw it out of there, chisel it out, I could even use a router or, you know, any kind of, if I chew on it, maybe it'll come up with that material missing. So pretty quick and easy, on to the next jig. The second jig I wanna show you is a very simple single point fence. Now this one's a very low one. You can make them much higher for using it for resawing and stuff. But so generally speaking, I use the, the single point fence uh, at this size because what I'm making with it is edge banding. So I'll take about a two inch pack. This is just a scrap of wood. Yeah, I know it's kind of curly maple there. I'm going to set my bevel again, not exactly a necessity. What I want to do is find the center. Yeah, that's a little off. So we'll come this way. And what I want to do is I want to leave maybe about a sixteenth to an eighth of an inch flat on the end. And I would like to get this, I want to try and get these sides on a fairly steep angle. The, the tighter I make it, the more I can get around things if I'm, if I'm actually using this as a, a single point fence to make a curve. So now I just go over to the bandsaw and we'll cut those two sections off. For this video, I'm actually raising the guard up higher than I would normally have it so that you can actually see what's happening. So the only thing left is for me to set this up and show you how it works. So for my little single point fence, the setup is pretty easy. What I really want to do is clamp it to the table. Put that clamp over. And what I'm looking for is the very point of my single point fence to be just in front of the teeth on my bandsaw. The reason for that is I can actually set my material directly up against the fence and start to cut it. This is a piece of white oak, but for this demo, we're going to imagine that it's a piece of edge, three quarter inch wide edge banding. Uh, I've got my guards way up out of the way. I would actually bring the guide and the guards down as close to the single point fence as possible. Now, as I said, if I was going to use this for resawing, what I would do is I would take a board that was about as wide as the material I'm resawing, and I would cut that single point out on that wide width, and I would cut it down so that I could still clamp the whole fence to the, to the bandsaw table, but then I would have a guide that runs the entire width of the board that I'm cutting. So a lot of people will look at this setup and see that there's absolutely nothing that's gonna make this cut perfectly straight. So they're gonna look at this and say, well, you've only got about between a 16th and an eighth of an inch gap between the fence and the blade. How am I ever gonna guide that? I'm gonna saw right through that 
that piece of wood with no trouble. Well, if you were in my bandsaw basics class, I talked last week about when you're cutting a curve, all you're trying to do is line up that eighth of an inch or a quarter of an inch in front of the blade with the body of the blade itself. The process is exactly the same here. We're going to just keep an eye on the, the space between the saw kerf and the end of the, the, end of the, the single point fence and cut a nice even strip. And as you can see, an absolutely perfect, 100% guaranteed uniform veneer that just came right off of that, that piece of edge bend or piece of white oak, depending on whether or not you uh, have suspended your uh, disbelief there. So on to the next one. For the next little bandsaw fixture, I've got a scrap of English walnut. You don't have to use that on yours. And what we're gonna make real quick is a wide feather board for resawing. This is just actually a little under the height of my fence. Ideally, I'd like it to be about the same size as the fence on my bandsaw because that way I get full pressure up against the fence the whole time. I'm gonna use my tenoning jig on my table saw. If you don't have a tenoning jig, come back in a couple of weeks and attend my table saw jig class and I'll show you exactly how to make one. I used a thin kerf blade on my table saw and had absolutely no problems making about a two inch deep cut. I'm going to cut this on a slight angle using the band saw and then we're ready to demonstrate how this works with resawing material. So I've set up my, my resawing feather board. I don't have it fully adjusted. I've got my fence locked into place. I really like to use the fence rather than a single point fence for resawing. You just get a whole lot more hold out of everything. It's a much more sturdy platform. So all, all I need to do to adjust this is set it on there at the right angle. I want it to be in front of the blade and give it a little bit of spring and then lock it down. And that's gonna keep it nice and tight. So I just gonna, I'm just i gonna give the end of my, my board a little tap, move it in just a little. And now you can see I've got a good firm pressure up against there. It's actually kind of hard to get it loose. I've already set my bands up just the same way that I did in the basics class, uh, following the snodgrass method, which means when I saw using even this quarter inch blade, it's not gonna drift away from this, this fence at all. And with that feather board on there, I'm not gonna have any problems in the least. Let's give this thing a cut.
So once again, two really nice, perfectly uniform thickness veneers coming off of there. And since I switched to the Carter blades on the saw, a whole lot better working surface. And for my final jig, I'm back to my Tiger Maple scraps again, and we're gonna make a pattern jig that is going to allow you to cut and shape a single pattern and then use it as a template to cut other pieces. So the first thing we need to do is mark off the width of our blade. So I sort of get the, the block centered on that bandsaw blade. Put a couple of tick marks on there. Now we'll take a square and transfer those up. So essentially I'm cutting a very small groove in the end of my board here that is going to match the width and the thickness of my bandsaw blade. Actually I'm not sure if it's a groove or a dado because I don't think it really matters because I'm not cutting it with a dado stack. So here we go. So as you can see, I just went in, made the cuts at either side of the, the piece, and then very carefully, very shallow cuts, all I had to do was move the material back and forth in front of the blade, and the teeth just sort of nibbled away that groove right in the end of my board. Now all I need to do is give it some kind of rounded corners so that when I run my patterns, I'm not bumping into the corner of my stick or my guide before I've actually cut off the pieces. So let's cut that out. So now all I need to do is show you how it works. To set up the tracing jig for use, what you want to do is you want to boost the, the jig above the table by slightly more than the material you're actually cutting. You, it can be any distance above that material as long as it doesn't go past your pattern. What we use this jig for most in my shop was making scallop drawer fronts for the interiors of desks. So we've got a flat pattern that I made out of a piece of quarter inch Baltic birch plywood. It's got the profile on there. And you can see when I set it up, it obviously clears the, the material below that's going to get cut, but the pattern uh, fully engages the jig itself. So let's make a cut and see just how it works. As you can see, it was really easy to use. The first drawer that I cut out matches up fairly well with that second drawer, a little bit of cleanup, and everything should be dead on perfect. This jig can be used for a whole lot more than just simply cutting out scallop drawer fronts 
on the interiors of slant front desks. You can use it for legs and feet and all kinds of things. Anything that you can attach a pattern to, you can now duplicate in multiples directly from the bandsaw. Wait, wait, wait. I've got one more quick thing to show you. This is a really easy one. You make it just like you would a table saw sled. And if you don't know how to do that, come back in two weeks. It's part of my table saw class. I made a strip of wood up that fit into the miter gauge slot on the bandsaw, attached uh, a long sled base to it and a back fence. We use jigs like this throughout the years for cutting edge banding and mitering inlay. I made the base of the sled long enough that not only can I make straight cuts on one end, but if I reverse the jig and tilt the table over to 45 degrees, I can trim and miter inlay. Once again, not the only thing that you can do with, these, with this jig but certainly a really handy little thing to cobble together. You notice that I didn't spend a whole lot of time making my jig nice and pretty. You can do whatever you like. Well, there you have it. That's a few of my essential woodworking jigs and fixtures for the bandsaw. Now, you'll notice that I didn't include a circle jig because, well, first of all, everybody has a circle jig for their bandsaw, probably except me. I don't use one because I never make that many discs that need to be exactly the same size at one time. I may make 24 inch diameter tables now and then, but you know, honestly, if I'm gonna cut out one circle, I don't need to go through and have this big jig that mounts to my saw and has to take up room in my shop to be able to cut out a two foot diameter circle, even a three foot diameter circle. So. I don't bother with a circle jig. You know, the jigs that I showed you here today really help me specifically in the work that I do. You saw that single point fence really comes in super handy. Uh, I showed you just the sh short version of it so that, you know, that's what I use when I cut edge banding and things like that. I'll glue up a pack of edge banding and slice it off and that's the perfect way to do it. You get the efficiency of the bandsaw with that thin kerf blade and with that single point fence they come out absolutely laser straight every single time. The feather board for for use on the the resaw great and honestly to go back in there and start cutting all of my case dovetails by hand after making the jig like this so much easier and faster to just do a real quick layout, walk over to the bandsaw, cut all my pins out, and then it's on to waste removal and assembly. It's super easy, super fast. So hope you enjoyed this seminar. If you did, remember, I'm Chuck Bender. If you didn't, I'm Jim Heavey. Also, please check out my website at acanthus.com. I run hands-on classes in my school here in my shop, and the great thing is they're limited to only two or three people. So check out, all, check out the class schedule on my website. You can also check out the live streaming classes that I'm running. They are something totally different for woodworking education because it's interactive. You don't just sit there and watch me do this stuff. I turn around and turn the camera on you and watch and coach you through every step of either a project or a skill class. So please check it out, acanthus.com. You can also check out some of my portfolio there if you want. It's right underneath the link that says Chuck's portfolio. So, hey, thanks again.